Sometimes no news can be good news. No government shutdown, no new flare up in US China relations, and no new surge in inflation numbers. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on whether we're through the worst on inflation. I'm not sure the inflation figures over the next two years are going to be quite as favorable as the market is expecting. Tony James of Jefferson River Capital on the past and future of private equity and credit. Private equity really needs to be operational as well. You still need the transaction skills, you still need to be an investor, but now you need to be able to intervene in the company's fortunes. And Dan Senor about the Israeli-Hamas war and what it means for the Israeli economy. They can get through the short term. I think in the long run, Israel's tech economy will be stronger. Global Wall Street had an exciting week, mainly because of what didn't happen. President Biden met with President Xi during the APEC summit, and they appeared to set a new, more constructive tone to U.S.-China relations. Our meetings have always been candid and straightforward. We haven't always agreed, but they've been straightforward. And today, build on the groundwork related over the past several months of high-level diplomacy between our teams. We've made some important progress, I believe. The U.S. Congress got its act together and finally agreed not to shut the government down, at least until after the new year. I have good news for the American people. This Friday night, there will be no government shutdown. But most exciting for Global Wall Street this week were those CPI numbers that came in even better than expected, pointing to a continued slowing in the rate of inflation and maybe, just maybe, no need for the Fed to keep hiking rates. It's a rather amazing uh, number this morning. CPI comes in flat. The estimate was one-tenth, and it had been 0.4 back in September, and that leaves the year-over-year -year headline number <coughs> at 3.2 percent, down from 3.7. And then late on Friday, word came that the man who made ChatGPT famous, Sam Altman, was stepping down immediately as CEO of OpenAI after the board lost confidence in his candor, and Microsoft shares dropped on that news. The markets overall had a nice bump up during the week with the news about slowing inflation and a strong economy. The S&P 500 was up 2.24 percent, ending at 4514. That's comfortably above the median number of our Bloomberg elves that they're predicting for year end. The Nasdaq was up 2.37 percent, while the yield on the 10-year dropped almost 22 basis points to 4.4. Here to tell us what it all means are Sarah Malik, Nuveen Asset Management CIO, and Peter Borish, Computer Trading CEO. So welcome back, both of you. It's great to have you here. Sarah, let me start with you. Was it really all about the CPI numbers in the end for this week? Well, the Santa Claus rally has come early this year for three reasons. One of those is inflation, which is coming in under expectations. Also, the Fed has signaled the end of the rate hike cycle. And finally, the economy, which is showing some signs of cooling, but not enough to take us into a recession. All of this caused 10-year Treasury yields to drop by about 50 basis points and markets to rally. However, I caution 2024 looks a little bit more complicated. The question is going to move not from how high will interest rates go, but to how long will interest rates stay high. And given that futures markets are expecting four rate cuts in 2024, I think that's optimistic because inflation is still above target and we're not in a recession. So I don't see why the Fed would be cutting rates so aggressively going into next year. So, Peter, before we get to 2024, which we do want to get to, what about for the rest of this year? Can we put our pencils down on our desks? Are we in pretty good shape for the rest of this year, do you think? <laughs> You know, in this business, a week can be a long time. Just look at the move from two Fridays ago to this Friday. So, no, and you can never put your pencils down. And if you listen to some of the Fed talk, uh, President Collins, they're kind of like, wait a second, financial conditions aren't really that tight. If you look at the equity markets, we may have to raise again. So I agree with Sarah. I, I mean, I'm in the camp that I don't even think the Fed is going to cut at all next year and that's going to make for a bumpy road and depending on what the co news conference is after the next fed meeting this could sort of be an upside down remember in 2018 you had the tremendous rally the last week of the year this could be the opposite of that oh really so the reverse of a santa claus rally well you have a you know if you pick any low in the fourth quarter by definition you're going to have a rally off of it 
So yeah, she said we had an early Santa, so we had Santa Claus rally. We had a low, we rallied. Uh, but then we could have a nice little correction going into the end of the year. So, sir, how much of it do you think is in the hands of the Fed? We all focus on the Fed. It's understanding what we do. But it's not just the Fed that determines things like yields, for example. We've got a lot of issuance coming out of the Treasury these days. It looks like that's not going to stop anytime soon. I think it is still very important. And what is the Fed going to do next year? Let's start with inflation, which Peter talked about, which will have to do with whether we get rate cuts. Inflation is still about a percent above the Fed's target when it comes to CPI. And that last mile of inflation could be the longest mile. Our view is that inflation likely doesn't hit target in 2024. That's going to prevent you from getting aggressive rate cuts. So that's going to be an issue for the Fed. And also looking at the economy, the consumer and employment markets have been driving the economy. Payrolls are still coming in close to 200,000. Yes, we did see unemployment claims spike to August levels this, this week. So employment is starting to slow. Consumers starting to show some cracks when it comes to delinquencies. But none of that means a recession is imminent. Until you get those two factors of inflation at or below target and a recession right in front of us, I don't think the Fed's going to have the room to cut rates. But what about the equity side, Sarah? Because we've had sort of a, a, a I can say a subdued earnings, uh, earnings session here. What are we looking for in 2024? Well, Q3 marked the end of our earnings recession. Before Q3, we had three quarters of negative earnings. So it was good to see this growth in third quarter. And in 2024, we expect about 5% earnings growth. That'll be positive. It will be, will be dependent on companies' ability to preserve margins as inflation continues to moderate. So that'll be the positive. I don't think we're going to see a lot of valuation expansion driving the markets in 2024 because valuations are already at a premium. So, Peter, what about the consumer? Because the consumer really feeds directly into earnings because companies have to sell things. Uh, where is the consumer right now? Are they running out of all that excess uh, savings that they had? Well, first of all, Sarah made a great point. But when I look at the consumer, I kind of try to watch, you know, Visa and MasterCard mm -hmm. as a proxy for consumer. And those stocks have continued to stay strong, close to their all-time highs. So I think it's a little premature given the fact that employment is still high, right, unemployment is low, again, another indication that financial conditions are not tight, and therefore, I think the higher probability of rates going up. So the consumer's in pretty good shape for now, but I look at the three C's, right, copper, corn, and crude. And they have been weak, so that's saying something about the aggregate demand in the economy. So that's the irony of markets. They have been weak, that drags down inflation, but is that bullish? Sarah, you Peter like brings up a good point, David, about the consumer. They continue to spend, and consumer discretionary stocks have been very strong this year. But if you look behind, under the hood, at the consumer, auto and credit card delinquencies are increasing significantly. I think the consumer is starting to show some cracks. And if the employment markets continue to slow and people do not feel secure in their jobs, I think that'll be the unwinding of the economy that does eventually get us into that recession. But again, as I said, that is not right around the corner. Sarah, you usually like to pick a stock or two for us. Do you have a stock or two to recommend? We do. So we're looking at, first of all, we think the dollar's going to be, it's at peak levels and going to weaken from here. So outside of the U.S., uh, countries where there could be demand and also commodities, which tend to benefit from a weaker, weaker dollar. Peter mentioned copper. That's an area that we like. Supply is tight for copper. Free, Freeport Macmoran is a company specifically. They're finishing their last smelter in Indonesia in early 2024. So CapEx is declining, and they are returning cash to shareholders. Demand for copper is strong. Not only has U.S. production of copper declined significantly over the last half century, but also wind, solar, electric vehicles, and increased need for U.S. infrastructure as we onshore, all of that will increase demand for copper. Copper, multi-year tailwinds for that commodity. Peter, is it too soon to get back in the pool for real estate? Well, there was a very interesting article on Bloomberg today about how so many homeowners actually don't have a mortgage. So this notion that, well, the market's frozen because people don't want to sell because they have low mortgages, that may not be true. If that's the case and people want to trade their stock, that may increase the housing supply and that could drive down some prices again. Ironically, is that bullish or bearish for interest rates as housing demand gets met with increased supply? So is it too soon? No, but it's going to be interesting. 
Fascinating. What I about think an area, David, within REITs that looks really attractive is actually the public REIT sector. It's trading at a discount to net asset value. REITs actually tend to underperform while rates are going up. And in periods of rate pauses and rate cuts, REITs outperform. And I think that's what we're getting to. This elongated pause by the Fed should be positive for segments such as REITs. Well, Sarah, that's fascinating. I mean, REITs got clobbered, obviously. Uh, do you think they've bottomed? They're going to come back up? We've actually seen them bottom in the last couple of weeks as yields rolled over. And if you look at history, as the Fed pauses, and we don't expect any more Fed rate hikes, that should be positive for REITs. They're still cheap. They're trading at a discount to NAV. Many are worried about commercial real estate, but if you look at the main REIT benchmarks, it is a very insignificant low single-digit percentage portion of their benchmarks. Industrial REITs, apartment REITs, all of those are actually uh, doing very well. So it's not just a commercial real estate story. That's a very small piece of REITs. Sarah Malik and Peter Borsch are going to be staying with us. But first, we're going to take a look back at another time when we watched the Fed wait patiently for inflation to come down. Here's Frank Cappiello on Wall Street Week with Louis Ruckheiser way back in 1982. This is a whole new aberration. And I think what's, what's happening is economic policies now are more important than the statistics. And the policies are less inflation, We've uh, really got a Federal Reserve that's fighting uh, many recurrence of inflation, and uh, we've got interest rates that will eventually come down. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. President Xi is desperate for American investment because he has made a series of economic decisions uh, and political decisions arresting people where capital is fleeing. The coin of the realm for the United States, we have allies, we have friends, and they want to be aligned with us. That was U.S. Ambassador to Japan Rahm Emanuel talking at the Apex Summit this week in San Francisco about efforts by Chinese President Xi to attract Western investment flows back into China. Sarah Malik of Nuveen and Peter Borish of Computer Trading have stayed with us. So, Sarah, let me start with you. We had the meeting with President Biden, President Xi. Not a lot came out of it, except they did talk. They didn't fight with one another. I guess that's good. But overall, do you think this affects the, the really the, the status of investments right now, that, in fact, U.S. and China may be at least not at daggers drawn? I think there's two issues to think about from this week's meeting and over the long term. One is geopolitical issues, which I think did become reduced a bit this week. You saw that with CDS spreads narrowing a bit. But the main issue with China is exports. They've declined significantly in terms of what they export to the U.S. over the last five years. And that I think until they can turn that around, that's going to be an issue. And there's other countries that are benef benefiting from this, like Mexico with its nearshoring, the increased need for infrastructure in the U.S., which is a segment of the market that we really like, countries like Indonesia with young populations, and Japan, which is benefiting with their weaker yen. So as China loses in these areas, these other emerging and developed international countries are winning. And I, I don't see that trend reversing in the near term in, when it comes to China's exports to the U.S. Peter, you talked earlier about commodities. We often think about China when it comes to things like copper, for example. Uh, to what extent is the demand for copper, the price of copper, going to be determined by what happens in China and whether they can really rebound in their economy? Well, I think a lot of that. And you could see earlier this week they, they laid out the objective by doing a big soybean purchase. Right, which reminds us of the early 70s when you had another crisis and they came in and bought a bunch of grain before uh, President Nixon went to China. But I think the history lesson here is that emerging countries and their markets understand that if you partner with the U.S., you get rich. Now, you've had growth and they got rich and then they're like, okay, we don't need you anymore. This crisis in China has made them realize that if you want to stay rich, you need to partner and continue partnering with the U.S. So what Sarah said is, is critical. And yes, so they, they need our capital, as Ambassador Emanuel just said. But people aren't going to fly in there. They have to demonstrate that the capital is going to be safe, that the human capital in China is going to continue to be safe. So it's going to be a little bit of a slower process. So when, and that's going to be reflected not an immediate demand for commodities and copper, but a slow and steady demand, as Sarah was saying earlier. Sarah, just briefly here at the end, what, about, what does that mean for other opportunities? For example, in, China, in Japan, I think you've just gotten back from Japan, have you not? 
I was. I was in Japan last week. And Japan's economy is growing very strongly for two reasons. One, the increased focus on governance, not only within the country, but from non-Japan investors. Secondarily, Japan, Japanese government is very focused on getting individuals out of cash into more investable asset classes. And second is the Japanese economy is going very strong. The yen has been weak. However, our view is with some moderate inflation that we're seeing in Japan and likely higher interest rates, I think the yen is likely to bottom and reverse from here. But that does not unwind the Japan story that has been very strong this year and should continue. And finally, Peter, also Mexico is a lot more attractive than it was. Absolutely, for the near sourcing, for their innovation. Uh, and, you know, again, climate change has a little impact on that because we were saying earlier that the Panama Canal is low, so uh, Mexico is trying to build and increase their transportation infrastructure. I just want to add in 10 seconds China, Japan, that story, that's bearish for U.S. Treasuries because they are both selling Treasuries yeah. to focus on their, U on their domestic economies. It's a globally integrated world. So you have to be careful what you wish for. Uh, what about that? Just a word or two, Sarah. Do you agree there's a problem here with foreign buyers of treasuries? I think Peter makes a good point, and that could right. be a headwind. Okay. Thank you so much, both of you, for being back with us. That's Peter Borsch of Computer Trading and Sarah Malik of Nuveen. Coming up, we welcome back Dan Sinor. He's author of the new book, The Genius of Israel, for an update on Israel's war with Hamas. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Israel's war with Hamas continues, with Israeli troops fighting Hamas in Gaza as the humanitarian toll mounts. Dan Sinner was a foreign policy advisor to George W. Bush when he was president in his administration and as well to Mitt Romney. He is the author of a brand new book. It's called The Genius of Israel. So, Dan, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thanks. Congratulations on the book. Congratulations on the fact that it's on the New York Times bestseller Thank list, you. I should Thank mention. You. you actually wrote this book, completed it before what happened last October 7th. Uh, at the same time, you were anticipating some difficulties within Israel. There have been demonstrations because yeah. of what happened with the Department of Justice. Uh, so as we go forward now, one of your themes is Israel is resilient. You've right. got that in your subtitle. Resilient and comes together. What have you learned since October 7 about Israel? What we argued in the book, because we wrote the book at the point at which Israel is in the depth of internal division, as you say, and we, we argued that as divided as Israel was, it was politically polarized. And we said, look, most Western affluent democracies are very politically polarized. Israel's not immune to political polarization. The difference between Israel and other Western countries is Israel has these societal shock absorbers built into it, this like infrastructure that just as, as polarized as it may get, the country doesn't spin apart. And that's why we were we said that in a sense Israel's like a blueprint for the West to look at how, how they keep the country together, even when it looks like it's about to go over the edge. We look at the role of national military service, which is interesting because it not only, as we wrote in our first book about the tech economy, the national military, the compulsory service helps young people develop management skills, leadership skills, in some cases specific technology skills that help them in the startup scene. But in this book we focus on the national compulsory service brings Israelis together from all walks of life, religious and secular, politically right-wing, politi politically left-wing, people from the center of the country, like in booming cities like Tel Aviv versus the struggling towns of the periphery. It brings all these people together and has them in the hull of a tank or in the warehouse on a military base. And they are working together and living together, and it makes it harder for them to look at one another as the other. So that's, that's another important national uh, compulsory service. And then lastly on national compulsory service is they focus on the we, not the me. In other words, to be effective in national military service in Israel and in other parts, formative parts of Israeli life, you have to focus on being part of a team, community, a group. And we go through this in the book and say, compare that experience to how Americans go through life, trying to get into colleges, trying to get into elite colleges. It's all about your own individual performance, your own individual excellence. There's a lot to learn from Israel in terms of these institutions that keep people together, even though they see the world differently. And that's why we were hopeful that even if there were an October 7th event, an event, and we didn't anticipate an October 7th event, but even if there were one, it wouldn't surprise us if the country held together. Now, obviously, the first priority is dealing with security of the Israeli state and its people. At the same time, there is an economy, a thriving economy. Where does that stand right now, and what longer-term challenges might this war pose? Look, there's no doubt in the near term, 
this is a setback. You've called up 300, Israel's called up 360,000 people, 360,000 reserves. It's, a, it's the largest call up, I think, in its modern history. Uh, it's the, the number of Israelis that have been called up for reserves is, is larger than the standing armies of the UK and France combined. Those are people who work in the hospitality industry, in the tourism industry, not that there's a lot of tourism right now, and a lot of people who work in the tech economy. So I speak to venture capitalists in Israel quite regularly, and many of them tell me that their top, that you look, they look at their portfolio companies, about 10% of their top executives have been called up in one form or another. Does that mean these companies grind to a halt, these startups? No, but it does mean if they're in the middle of trying to close a fundraising round or in the middle of trying to complete a, a, you know, a, an M&A deal or some sort of business development or sales deal, it slows things down. That's the bad news. I think the size, the scale of the reserve call-up is going to shrink pretty soon, particularly Israel's making much more progress than I think anyone expected in Gaza. So I think they'll, they'll draw down on the reserves relatively soon. I don't know exactly when. And two, if you look at how Israel has, the economy has dealt with major security, like I go back to 1991, first Gulf War, when the whole country was shut down, when Saddam Hussein was launching Scud missiles into Israel and the whole country shut down, most of the multinationals set up in Israel that had Israel R&D centers, their Israel teams didn't miss a single deadline, didn't meet, miss a single milestone. So they've sort of proven that even when there are these security shocks, they still can hold together. I think the same will be true here in the long term. The short term, it's going to be pretty stressful. I do think the experience, so I hate to say what I'm about to say, but I do think the experience of these young people who run companies in Israel, going to, having to go through this experience, developing interdisciplinary skills, having to sub in for someone who's been called up, having to juggle a bunch of balls just, be, you know, when you're, in, when you're in Gaza for three days and you come back to work for a week and you go back to Gaza for three days, I do think there's a resilience factor that ultimately serves these companies in the long run well. If they can get through the short term, I think in the long run Israel's tech economy will be stronger. Israel has had, I think, a disproportionate effect in the global economy, given its size and its location. Is that in any way in jeopardy? The integration, certainly within the Middle East, we were hoping for uh, really a rapprochement with Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That certainly is not happening anytime soon. But even more broadly in Europe and as the rest of the world starts to be really uh, uneasy with what's yeah. going on in Gaza. So I think there are two, look, if the U.S. stays strong shoulder to shoulder with Israel during these next few months that are going to be difficult, I think the rest of the world will basically follow. I don't think Europe is going to go in a dramatically different direction than the U.S. That's why it's very important to Israel that it stays locked arms with the United States. And so far, that's, that's pretty good. That all indicators are that's pretty strong. The question, to your point, is the Gulf and the Arab world. That's where the most progress is being made. Now, if you go back and look at why the Sunni Gulf, Bahrain, the Emiratis, the Saudis were in the works, uh, as I call Israel's friends and Israel's future friends, why all that was deepening and warming was not out of love for Israel. Those countries were doing it because they believed in Israeli strength. They were betting on the strength of Israeli, Israel's economy, its tech sectors we were just talking about, its geopolitical positioning in the world, which had been growing. And they believed in the, the idea that Israel's military and intelligence capabilities were a juggernaut. And they wanted a piece of it. They wanted to be part of it because they shared a co common enemy, specifically Iran and the Muslim Brotherhood. Dan, it's really great to have you I'm back on Wall Street Week. That is Dan Sinor. He is the author of the new book, The Genius of Israel. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Private equity, it's been around a while, but it hit the big time back in the 80s when the leveraged buyout of RJR Nabisco put Henry Kravis up on the big screen. I'm talking about putting a mountain of money into everybody's pocket right now. Since the go-go days of LBOs, private equity and alternative investments more broadly have come a long way. The big guys like Kravis KKR, Steve Schwartzman's Blackstone, David Rubenstein's Carlyle, and Jim Coulter's TPG have gone from being the upstart pirates of finance to an entrenched and important part of the establishment. And along the way have been joined by a wide range of others, including the likes of Kim Kardashian. I've often said that private equity is the highest calling of mankind. Why did it take you so long to realize that and that to join the private equity world? Um, I finally got talked into it once I came to that realization. In the process, private equity has grown enormously, accounting today for some $12 trillion in assets, 
with Blackstone now managing over $1 trillion in assets all by itself, KKR about half that, and Carlyle about a third. And they've taken somewhat different paths, with Blackstone's emphasis on its access to private data that may not be as readily available to public markets. I believe uh, AI will reinforce and further the advantages, advantages of private market investing relative to public market investing. Why is that? Well, I think the reason for that is it's actually pretty simple. Public market investing, which relies obviously on publicly available data, um, that sort of data will, will be increasingly and further commoditized in an AI world. The value of that sort of information and data and ability to mine insights from that and have pattern recognition coming out of that, both longitudinally and across your business, that will only be further enhanced. To KKR's big move into Asia and stakeholder capitalism, our founders, Henry Kravis and George Roberts, say internally, they, they pioneered the private equity business. And they, you know, they said, if we were 22, we would go to Japan right now because that's actually where you're seeing some of the real movement and creating some opportunities. Look, private equity is not perfect. Uh, capitalism's not, not perfect. But this is a superior way of operating a company in every respect. But those most involved say they've only just begun. We have a very long-term view on building the business. You know, we don't just uh, uh, want to be a very good asset management company. That's uh, in addition to that. We want to build really one of the great companies in the world that is very enduring. That is Steve Schwarzman's vision and it permeates, you know, our culture and everything we do. And to take us through where private equity and the world of alternative investing more broadly is today, we'll someone who knows it terribly well. He is Tony James. He is the founder and chair of Jefferson River Capital and, of course, for years was president and COO of Blackstone. Tony, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure, David. So this has grown rather dramatically over the time you've watched it and participated in it. It's like a $12 trillion business today. It didn't start out that way in the 80s. So what gave rise to that? Why, why did it have such an advantage over other ways of investing? Well, as you point out, it started about 50 years ago, so there's something uh, pr appropriate for now dealing with that. It started as a bit of a curiosity industry. It was prim pr primarily dominated by investment bankers. They perceived that were, the public markets were, were not what they are today. There were, there were companies that were undermanaged, asset-heavy, kind of sleepy, and, and an investment banker would come in there, use the company's own assets to buy itself, spin off some assets, cut some costs, and then flip it out again and make some good returns. That pulled in more capital, of course, and, and after a while that became more competitive so that the private equity industry then needed to actually not only have the transactional skills, but they needed to be investors too. They needed to perceive value and where the company's going and is it, will it be a good company and will, it have a, will, will I be able to exit it at a good value? And so that expanded a lot, the opportunity set. But again, the success of that pulled in more capital. And so today it's evolved to where private equity really needs to be operational as well. You still need the transaction skills, you still need to be an investor, but now you need to be able to intervene in the company's fortunes and create value. So at Blackstone, we've, we figured we, uh, we could add, with, uh, by our own intervention, five to 10% on average of a company's EBITDA, just by things like procurement, redesigning the healthcare uh, plans, providing AI and data science, um, lean manufacturing, pricing, marketing, all of those things. And we could have world leading experts in that because we can, we can deploy them and frankly deploy their cost over 200 or so portfolio companies. Medium and small companies, which are the focus of private equity, can't really afford to have world class experts in all these, so, all these uh, specialty areas. So a private equity firm is very well uh, positioned to create the value and um, that's had some other implications. In the early days, the, the kind of buy a company that's, that's asset heavy, sell off some assets, you made all your money like in the first year or so. You cut some costs, you sold off some assets, and then you flipped it. Now, we're trying to create great companies. We're trying to grow them. And transforming a company takes a number of years. And you sow the seeds, but they don't blossom right away. So private equity has become much, much more of a long-term holder and builder of companies. And I would, wouldn't be surprised if in the early days of the industry, private equity actually cost jobs. But today, there's absolutely no doubt about it that it's a job creator. And um, so I, I think the industry's evolved to a better place. I, I, I kind of view, I mean, the, the gains of private equity are always going to pensioners. But now I view the private equity itself as a force for good in the economy 
to a much greater degree than it was way back when. Does that require more patience on the, on the part of people who are giving the money to invest? I mean, if you're holding the company a lot longer time to get those operational benefits, and, and is there that patience? And by the way, what about the liquidity issue? One of the issues on private equity has always been, I can't pull my money out when I want to. Right, right. It does definitely require more patience, but most investors now actually want longer holding periods because, because you get richer you get richer compounding something at 12% for 20 years than you do compounding it at 20% for five years. So the IRR that people talk about, the compounding, that's only one aspect of it. So a lot of investors, they want that money out, they want that money working for them over a long period of time, and they're, they're content with, with longer holding periods. We can get into different investor classes, but there are other ways you can get liquid if you really need it. Well, I was going to ask about the secondary. Uh, there's a secondary right. market now, as I understand it. So actually, right. you can get your money out through a secondary market, as I understand it. Explain that. Sure. Well, oh, this $12 trillion that's mushroomed out there, uh, inevitably, a certain number of investors want to get their money out. And it, not necessarily for uh, because of assets not performing for them. Private equity has been the best performing asset class for most institutions. Uh, and, and just as a sidelight, one of the ironies of that is uh, if an institution has an asset allocation model, so 20% in private equity, 20, 40% in public equity, 40% in debt, let's just say, and private equity outperforms, what happens is that all of a sudden they have more than 20% in private equity, right? And so now they need to sell down private equity. So it's, it's got a kind of a, <laughs> a counterintuitive that success means they need to be net sellers, <laughs> uh, which is kind of odd, but that's the way, that's the way it works. So, but... But, but reallocating, rebalancing the portfolio, strategy changes with, 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 with corporate pension funds when they become fully funded. They then want to go out of risk assets and just uh, essentially lock in the, uh, um, with AA credit stuff, uh, the liabilities, so defeats the liabilities. Uh, if you're a retail investor, you have life changes, you get divorced, you have estate planning. So all those reasons, there are sellers of uh, LP interest and, the, and, and this business secondaries has, has ballooned to, to, as the primaries have. It's still lagging, but to, to, to be a, provide that liquidity. Tony, you just mentioned retail investors. I think if you go back 10 years ago, I wouldn't have thought of retail investors in the same sentence with private equity. H how has that changed? To what extent are retail investors coming in? And what is the profile of those retail investors in general? Well, um, it started off as very high net worth investors that are almost mini institutions in a way. But now it's down to the mom and pop. And the industry has evolved to create products that are more and more appropriate for smaller investors. And retail investors have the same need for returns that institutions do. Um, and you know, we've essentially had a 40-year downtrend in interest rates, but that's pulled the returns across all asset classes down. So the need for added returns becomes more and more acute. At the same time, institutions realized, particularly the first, the first were the endowments of the universities. They were the most sophisticated, David Swenson and so on and so forth. Then there were the pensions, and then and now to the, to the high net worth individuals. Uh, endowments have about 50% of their endowments in private assets. Pension funds about 25. Retail investors, less than five. Mm. So they still have a ways to go. And, and what the institutions realized is I don't need all that liquidity. I'm never going to need to, to liquidate everything overnight. And I think increasingly high net worth institute individuals are realizing the same thing. Um, if you have assets, financial, if you own your home and you say you're lucky enough to have a second home and you have financial assets, multiples of annual spending, do you really need to be able to liquidate everything tomorrow? Because it has a real cost. It has a real cost in lower return. And so it, it also has a cost because it's tempting because individuals tend to do the wrong thing. They get worried when the markets are collapsing. That's probably the time they should buy, but they end up selling. And they get ebullient when they see everyone making a lot of money and they throw them, themselves in the market. That's probably the time they shouldn't do that. So it's got a counterintuitive uh, negative, too. So yeah, it, it's, it, reach, the, the, sort of the new frontier is retail investors. And the big new frontier is, is, uh, is um, not their ultra high net worth, but the, the mass market. And that's growing? Very much, yeah. OK, Tony, really great to have you with us on Wall Street. We really appreciate it. That's Tony James of Jefferson River Capital. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're joined once again by our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, welcome back. Great to have you here. Let's start with one of the major events of the week, and that was the President Xi and President Biden actually meeting uh, around the APEC meetings out there in San Francisco. It's hard to know where this will go, but so far so good. They seem to be trying to really pull themselves back from the precipice. Look, it's important to have meetings like this. Uh, Churchill famously said, much better jaw jaw than uh, bang bang. On the other hand, I think we need to remember that there are very difficult fundamentals here. Very different systems, very different views of the world, profound competition in the technological arena, concerns on the American side about China subversion of our international, our vision of the international system uh, compares c concerns on the Chinese side that the United States is trying to hold them uh, down. So there are very profound geopolitical forces at play, and this struggle is going to be with us for a very long, a very long time. So I'm. Glad to see the meeting, but I'm concerned, and I'm particularly concerned in light of the gravity of the economic challenges that China is facing. And my concern is that, as with the Soviet Union uh, in the 1960s, a sense of very serious economic challenges is going to drive a felt need for increasing assertiveness in the international arena, as we saw with Khrushchev's moves on Berlin, as we saw with the placement of missiles in uh, Cuba. And while I don't see anything concrete like that that's happening right now, I think the economic distress and the link to nationalism, given some of the very strong positions that Xi has taken, is something that is going to require the United States and the West to be on their guard going forward. Global Wall Street has paid a lot of attention this week to those CPI numbers that came out for the United States. Some people are, if not declaring victory, close to declaring victory over inflation. Are they premature? Look, those were good numbers. Those were better numbers than I would have expected, better numbers than I think most people would have expected. And I think inflation performance has been more favorable, uh, certainly, than I have expected over the last uh, year. And I've thought a lot about that, David, and I think there are two or three factors to emphasize. Uh, the first is that policy has been much tighter than was anticipated. In July of 2022, markets were assigning a probability of under 10 percent to the level of tightness in policy uh, that we have uh, seen so far. So more tight policy has led to better outcomes on inflation. That doesn't mean inflation fears were unwarranted. It means that people took the fears seriously, which was good. I think that's one important aspect. I do think that given how strong the economy has been, there's still a surprise in what's happened to inflation. And that, I think, has to do in part with transitory factors, transitory factors that were pushing inflation up from bottlenecks that are now mean reverting and are pushing inflation down. So I think there's been a little bit of prematurity in some of the declarations of victory. And I'm not sure the inflation figures over the next two years are going to be quite as favorable as the market is expecting, especially in light of the geopolitical risks around oil and uh, some other uh, commodities. So we'll have to see whether we're really able to get down to 2 percent quite as easily as uh, many people uh, imagine. And what is the risk right now of a recession in the first half of next year? It's certainly under 50-50, David. I think it's probably on the order of uh, 20, 25, uh, uh, 25 percent that ultimately something will happen which will cause the NBER uh, to date a recession as having begun in uh, the first half of the year. 
in general, when recessions come, we don't even know that we're in them till they've been underway for uh, several months. So I think you got to recognize that as a real risk. On the other hand, with what we've been seeing in the employment reports, incomes are continuing uh, to grow. So I don't think that is the preponderant uh, scenario. One thing that may be adverse in store is actually the size of the federal deficit. A lot of talk about that this week. It appears we've avoided actually shutting down the government. People came to their senses, but it's only up to next January before they come to it again. And the main issue is not even what they did this week, but the larger issue about the weight that this may impose on the U.S. economy. If somebody's got a basic problem of being overweight, it's good if they skip dessert. It's good if they check into a spa for a weekend. But what really matters is whether they change their habits and they change their lifestyle. And nothing in this agreement uh, or anything in the discussions currently underway is about changing the American habit or lifestyle with respect to spending and taxes. I look at the world right now, and it is the most ominous world geopolitically that I have seen, certainly since the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. I look at projections for the federal budget that call for defense spending as a share of GDP to fall substantially. I don't think that should happen, and I don't think that will happen, almost regardless of how domestic politics play out. And so I think as I look at the budget picture, we got to recognize that we've got a big national li defense liability ahead of us that we're not really budgeting for in the current uh, projections. And much more generally, David, uh, is a very profound question of how long the world's greatest uh, debtor will remain the world's greatest and most secure uh, power. And so I think that everybody talks about our resilience as a country. Well, part of resilience for a company, part of resilience for a household is containing your leverage and containing your borrowing. And I think that's something we need to think about as a nation. Larry, just give us a little wisdom from the 1990s. You served in the Clinton administration back then when they got their arms around the budget. And my recollection, to continue your analogy to dieting, if you're going to lose weight, you can't just exercise, you can't just cut back on what you eat, you got to do both. And right now, one might think we have one party who doesn't want to increase taxes and increase revenues, the other doesn't want to cut spending. How did you manage in the 1990s to get over that hump? Well, I'm happy to try to answer the question how Bill Clinton uh, managed. I don't want to be the one taking credit for the 1993 uh, budget, uh, budget deal. Look, I think he laid out the case. He brought people together. He was willing to do things that were painful uh, for, his, for, for the people uh, who were his, uh, his friends. He was able to explain the case to the American people. And that's the kind of leadership we're going to need. And he reaped a benefit that I think people need to recognize and that maybe hasn't come into focus quite yet. Okay, Larry, thank you so very much. Always great to have you with us. That's Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, second acts. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and sometimes you end up with the cat. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. F. Scott Fitzgerald told us that in American lives, there are no second acts. The annals of business and politics and sports are filled with stories of stars who had great first acts but fell short when they tried to come back. Think Michael Jordan's ill-fated career as a professional baseball player after he had dominated the world of basketball. Or famed Hollywood agent Michael Ovitz, who left an indelible stamp on the entertainment industry with his creation of CAA, 
only to struggle with a transition to the corporate world under Michael Eisner. But that doesn't keep people from trying, and sometimes succeeding. All the way back to the early 19th century, when President John Quincy Adams lost to his arch rival, Andrew Jackson, only to come back as a congressman, and some have suggested he had more success in that role. Or Arnold Schwarzenegger, who went from action star of the big screen to become a successful governor of California. I'll be back. Just within the past two years, we've had two notable comebacks in the corporate world, as Howard Schultz returned for a second time to run Starbucks, and he seriously considered a second act that would go way past coffee. I am seriously thinking of running for president. Bob Iger returned as CEO to Disney just under a year ago and was praised by competitors like Reid Hoffman. Bob is, I think, one of the great CEOs of our time. Part of what you want CEOs to be doing, which is acting like owners and feeling that the, the important thing is the legacy of the company that they hand on to their successors, to employees, to society, and I think Bob is that guy. And even as we speak, we have Donald Trump, the 45th president, trying to come back as the 47th vowing to make America great again, again. In order to make America great and glorious again, I am tonight announcing my candidacy for President of the United States. But perhaps the oddest story of attempted second acts comes not from America, but from Great Britain. We all remember David Cameron, that young, charismatic British prime minister who was so confident his fellow Britons wanted to stay in the European Union that he decided to put it to a vote. He was wrong. They voted to leave and Mr. Cameron had little choice but to leave as well. The British people have made a very clear decision to take a different path. And as such, I think the country requires fresh leadership to take it in this direction. Now, seven years later, another struggling Tory Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has decided to bring Mr. Cameron back, not as Prime Minister, to be sure, but as his Foreign Secretary. Things are quite a bit different today than they were when Mr. Cameron left number 10. The world's been through a pandemic, the promises of economic prosperity made by the Brexiteers have proven largely hollow. And the polls point to Labour being back in power with the next general election. The labor market data was also pretty positive. Wage growth decelerated a little bit. Um, it's still incredibly high, though, and so I would put all of this in the category of good news. But David Cameron will have one friendly face to greet him when he pays visits to number 10 Downing Street, that of Larry, the chief mouser at the prime minister's residence a cat who shared the house with the Camerons back when they were in charge. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and this is Bloomberg. See you next week.